afternoon, good morning. This meeting is being recorded. Good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. <laughs> uh, this is the Growing Through Capital uh, webinar that is um, being hosted by AGRA uh, through our platform, the Africa Green Revolution Forum. And I really want to welcome you all to this particular session. Today, we will be interrogating how to bring more investment on the continent. And just to give you a little bit of an overview of what is needed, by the last count, the UN agencies that are based out of Rome, that is IFAD, WFP, and FAO, estimated that we needed around $180 billion annually to be invested into agriculture so that we can bring about the food systems you know, transformation. And this is a collective number, both for the private sector, but also uh, for governments and donors. So you can imagine the amount of money that is needed. And this, uh, and today we will be engaging specifically the private sector to see how we can work together to attract money from investors uh, so that it can flow towards companies that really, really need the investment so that we can bring about a food systems transformation. So uh, today we do have two investors. We have Lloyd Muposhi, uh, who is a CEO of APC. And then we also have Bita Wycliffe, who is an investment manager from Goodwell Investment. And then we have two companies. We have Francis Nderitu, who is a founder and MD of Rhino Tech for Impact. And then we also have Femi Aiki, I hope I'm pronouncing your name well, who is a CEO of Food Locker. So I will be introducing them again when we go to the panel. But before um, we go too much into the discussion, just a bit of housekeeping. So uh, delegates, if you have any question, I would encourage you to post it in the Q&A and not in the chat box. So please post any question in the Q&A. Secondly, we have interpretation. I think in three languages, Portuguese, French, and Kenya, Rwanda. So for those of you who are not uh, very good with English, you will be getting your interpretation. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Vanessa Adams, who is our Vice President for Strategic Partnerships, and also the Chief of Party for the Partnership for Inclusive Agriculture Transformation in Africa, to give us some opening remarks so that we can frame our discussion today. Over to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much and welcome to everyone. Uh, we are so pleased that nearly 200 uh, partner stakeholders and businesses have joined online with us today. Um, I also am uh, welcoming you all to have a vibrant conversation in the chats, uh, in the discussion channels, um, because really this is about a, a deep dive session into how business uh, can catalyze uh, investment and growth in Africa. Um, as many of you know, uh, Agra is uniquely positioned to, and proud to be hosting this agribusiness field room. And as Valentine said so correctly, the need isn't, uh, isn't decreasing. In fact, it's increasing. Uh, the situation across the globe relative to food insecurity has been tremendously disturbed, as you all know, with the most recent compounded conflicts compounding on top of COVID. And many of you already found that you had to pivot your business during COVID. In fact, we surveyed a number of um, entrepreneurs in the first year of COVID who were 30% um, of whom were within months of having to shut down due to cash flow limitations and market challenges. So we know that um, the situation uh, 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 on the one hand is increasingly difficult, but on the other hand, it's an opportunity for those of you who are pivoting your environment, pivoting, pivoting to a new reality, pivoting to food and resilient, uh, resilient food systems. So, it's with great pleasure um, that we welcome you today uh, to this session. I thought it would be interesting for many of you to know uh, a few different things about the agribusiness steel room. 
the first is that we know very well uh, how um, uh, many businesses are challenged by government regulatory changes, uh, policy inhibitions. So you not, don't only uh, need growth for your businesses to grow and actually um, increase capital, but many of you are also searching, searching for stakeholder uh, partnership support. And so um, we just want to reiterate that the deal room has four different pillars, one of which is the government engagements. And during the last few deal rooms, uh, since we began in 2018, we have had as many as 17 governments joining and supporting their private sector uh, pitches, public private sector opportunities and flagships. Um, and so we think that there's an opportunity for all of you who are participating to also be engaging locally, nationally, regionally, and continentally. The other thing that many of you may not realize, but there have been actually over 100 countries participating in the agribusiness deal room. Uh, so the level of participation across the globe actually has been significantly increasing. Um, the other point, of course, uh, that uh, coming out of COVID, for those of you who participated uh, last year in Kenya in the agribusiness deal room or the year before entirely virtually, uh, we have actually evolved from just a face-to-face -face engagement like we had in Ghana in 2019, where people thought you actually had to meet and shake hands and really know uh, in person the businesses that we were engaging in. In fact, we have seen seven uh, deals close since we launched the deal room processes, and more than half of that time has been during COVID shutdowns and through virtual engagements. Furthermore, uh, more than uh, 4,000 stakeholders have actually joined onto the Virtual Agribusiness Partnership Platform. So um, uh, 100 uh, plus uh, investors have actually looked into more than 800 SMEs, and we have been really, really excited uh, to see disbursements up to 10 million US dollars uh, going into SME expansion. So it, I think that the, 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 the third pillar of the deal room, which um, all of you have heard about and continue to think about is about sourcing in Africa. And that's growing your markets, increasing the supply chain sourcing. And that's something that we've supported with more women entrepreneurs, but also gaining global interest from larger partners who have found uh, opportunities, whether it be with um, sorghum for breweries or finger millet for healthy and nutritious foods, or now there's a growing interest in a beans challenge uh, to increase uh, nutritious school feeding programs. So this is a growing area of interest that many of you are well aware. And then finally, the other pitch um, uh, pillar of the deal room has been the B2B uh, matchmaking and the investor stakeholder platform uh, where businesses, there have been roundtables for the poultry sector, for rice sector, um, but also roundtables amongst investors to think about how to get more funds to reach SMEs, uh, more appropriate funds, longer term funds, lower interest funds. Um, more repayable investments and capital, um, blended finance, and even more types of insurance products. So we think that um, all of you really are the deal room and this collective engagement and voice will ultimately grow the pipeline of investable businesses who are um, transforming food across the continent. The last point I thought would be really interesting to make uh, here is around the enabling environment and ecosystem development. There's been a growing focus on environmental and sustainable governance uh, conditions for investments. And this is something that most African firms take as part of their DNA about who they are and why they're even in business. Social entrepreneurship is, is really at the heart of a lot of agribusinesses. But thankfully, the global community has started to establish much more stringent requirements for transparency and focus and reporting around environmental and sustainable 
uh, and governance, good governance. And so this is something that I think is of growing interest and hopefully our panel will point to some of the innovations and opportunities for Africa in this space. The last thing I'd like to say is, um, and I can see it in the chat and for all 250 of you who have now joined us online, you are entrepreneurs, your voice, your energy, your pride, your passion, your stories are what are selling you and keeping you going every day. Your innovations are, um, all, of, all of you are what we wanna help to see scale and benefit smallholder farmers across Africa. Um, and hopefully this will create a ripple effect globally. So whether these are digital innovations, whether it's improved technologies, whether it's a, a, a nutritious foods, whether you're um, providing BDS or consulting services to other businesses, service provision, uh, every single one of you have fought long and hard to be where you are today. And we really celebrate this entrepreneurship and hope to do everything we can to continue to support your growth. Thank you so much. Back to you, Valentin. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for framing uh, this session very, very well. And for delegates who are joining us as we continue, we are now at 253 delegates, which is very, very good. I would like to remind you just of a couple of things. Number one, if you have any question, please do post it in the Q&A section, not in the chat, because if you put it in the chat, we'll not be able to respond to you. Number two, um, we, we will be running some polls. So when those polls are put in, we would strongly encourage you to uh, you know, respond to them because we would like to know how to increase investment. Okay. So if you are not very familiar with English, there is French interpretation, there's Portuguese, and Kenya, Kenya Rwanda. Kenya Rwanda, my apologies. Kenya yes, Rwanda. Abatonva is in the name. Trazakwa fasha gusimura mchiro. So having you know provided that you know framing, I would like to. Uh, share with you just a little, you know, profile on who our panelists are, because we would like to move to the panel discussion. So I would like to start with Lloyd Mukoshi, who is the CEO of EPC. He's formerly a senior executive of Trade and Development Bank and has over 25 years of diverse experience in the corporate banking, you know, sector, and which really, really, uh, you know, uh, you know, he's able to bring all the, the the expertise both from a banking and from an investor perspective. And he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Zambia and a Master of Law. And I think law would be a very good one, especially when you're trying to write contracts with, with your investees uh, from the Northwestern uh, School of Law. And then we also have another investor who is Bita Wycliffe, the investment manager at Goodwill Investment, um, where uh, they are responsible for sourcing, appraising, and structuring, and executing investments, uh, especially in the early stage. But yeah, you know, but also uh, focusing a lot on tech business in agriculture. And then we have two companies uh, who are medium-sized companies that we, you know, will be sharing with us the experiences today. And we have Francis Deritu, who is a founder and MD of Rhino Tech for Impact Investment. He will tell us a little bit more on what that is. And you know, uh, you know, Francis took a leap in the year 2020 to found this particular tech platform and cold chain logistics, and he's been a beneficiary of the deal room. He's best out of Kenya, and he has grown his operations, especially through COVID-19, to reach 400 you know restaurants. And you know, Francis will give us a little bit more detail on how your business is doing. And then we have Femi Aiki, who is a CEO for Food Locker an entrepreneur who runs an e-commerce platform which focuses on grocery, foodstuff sourced from local farmers and are sold at fair prices to the consumer. So obviously today we are mainly focusing on agriculture investments. As you're all aware, you know, the African co continent, if you take an average, 30 to 40% of various African uh, you know, countries' GDPs are contributed by agriculture, which is the main reason why today will be mainly be focusing on investments into the agriculture sector because it is critical. So with that, I would like to um, pose the first question 
to our panelists. And I would like to start with uh, Lloyd. So Lloyd, if you could really speak to us because a lot of the companies online are trying to wonder and ask themselves, what is an investor looking for? How do I attract an investor to come and invest in my SME? So Lloyd, what would you be looking for to unpack an investable SME? Oh, th thank you very much. Um, I would start by saying that the first thing uh, one has to look at is what is it that I want to do? The, 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 what, what is it I want to invest in? What business do I, I want to get into? And clearly define that business uh, uh, proposition quite clearly. What I find from experience, why a number of proposals are being declined is that they're all over the place. You cannot zero in on what the company wants. Therefore, it leads to the second issue. How do I manage the risk if I invested in this business that uh, whose purpose and objectives are unclear? So I always tell my customers, first and foremost, you need to be clear exactly what are the key objectives, what is the key outcome that you want to do. The other area that is, is uh, key for an investor is the track record. Do you have the capacity or do you have the, the know-how or uh, what have you done to acquire the necessary skills that are required in the delivery of that, uh, th that objective, that business that you want to achieve? So as an investor, you want to see the track record. If somebody is coming in from, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, 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 mining into agri-processing, uh, you want to show, want to demonstrate some track record, either in terms of management, in terms of shareholding, in terms of strategic partnership. Then, then the, the, the other thing that we've seen, which is critical amongst the SMEs and uh, from the most proposals that we see is the, the composition of the, of, of, of the, of the company. Uh, preference will be a legally established entity with some level of governance in it. Uh, that shows the separation of function between the shareholders, the management. You want to see that clearly uh, 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 coming out in the, in, the, in the proposal. And uh, then you talk about the dynamics of the business. Exactly what will you do with the money that is given? How will this project absorb the resources that you're looking at? And then the operational side, do you have the right team? Do you know the pricing? If you're going into... Uh, 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 a maize or into soya pro production and selling. We want to see this now coming out clearly in your financial model, in your financial projection to show that you have uh, um, uh, put clearly the, the equity, the, the debt amount required and the, and the financial assumptions coming out very clearly in, in, the, in that uh, uh, business. And, 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 and lastly, uh, because I know I've, I've got to be fair to my other channel member uh, uh, participant is the, 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 the people want to know who am I investing into? Who are you? You know, what's your track record? Where are you coming from? Uh, how well do you know the industry that you're investing in? If you look at a, a, a coffee exporter has totally different business dynamics with a maize exporter. Uh, the, the industries are totally different. The, the pricing is different and so on. So the, the people want to have that comfort that indeed uh, you've understood things quite well. And even those assumptions, uh, based on experience and reality. So this is, uh, and, and, and just lastly, uh, two important points is also the, 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 the measures you take, you yourself, if we giving you money, what measures have you taken to protect the investment? And here I'm talking about things like insurance, I'm talking about security measures, and, and we are seeing this uh, in, in the region, even when I speak about East Africa region and even in other countries, today we are seeing issues of political risk coming up. There are companies that are providing insurance for political risk cover. So you also need to take a uh, look at that as though you were the, the investor or the, you were putting money in somebody else's business. How would they look at that business? So when you have a package 
that touches on some of these points I've mentioned, uh, you're able to, to, to actually get some favorable response. I think I'll end there yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> I, I can add on. <laughs> you, you know, Lloyd, you've really touched on very, very critical issues, but I really like one which is really about the person. You know, I read a book on how to sell yourself and really packaging yourself the person is really, because we invest in people. I mean, Lloyd, quite, quite critical. Yeah. So, Peter, I mean, uh, you know, same question. Uh, what are you looking for? You surely don't want to lose your money. Yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, Lloyd has, has uh, articulated it very well, but I'd, I'd just like to add on to a couple of points um, that he, that he um, and, and one is also the size of the market in which you're going to operate. Um, you know, as investors, we typically look at opportunities uh, that can be large enough um, in order for us to be able to also make a return from, return from our, our investment. Now, if you, if you think about it, um, in agriculture, it's, you know, you have to look at it slightly differently. And, and, and therein lies, you know, where you need an entrepreneur to really understand the market in which they operate, in, right? Um, because if you look at agriculture, you know, it, it's, very, it's very important in most of the economies um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So if you look at maize, you find that maize is, is a political crop in Kenya. It's a political crop in, in other markets as well. Um, so as an investor, you know, I want to ask myself, do I want to invest in, in a business that deals with maize? Do I want to deal with the political risk um, that comes in, 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 in maize processing? If I look at Maybe countries like Tanzania, for example, cashew nuts is, 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 is a political crop in that particular market. So I want to understand, does this person understand the risks that are inherent in this particular crop? Uh, do I want to kind of absorb um, the, the political risks that come in investing in, in, in cashew nuts? And I think also in, in, in line with that um, is also to have a clear understanding uh, of the entrepreneur, whether he understands the key problems. Uh, that are inherent in agriculture. So you're looking at, you know, access to inputs, access to finance, access to markets, um, and you really want to understand whether the business is aligned to solve some of these problems. Um, and if you think about it, you have input problems. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very big problem. Uh, and if the business, for instance, is, is trying to solve the input problem, you want to understand the kind of partners they have um, onboarded in that sense. Um, how are they going to structure that business to be able to kind of address the input problem? How are they going to structure the aspect of financing uh, of inputs? Because most farmers have cyclical incomes um, and maybe they may not be able to afford proper inputs. And so you want to understand how this entrepreneur kind of understands um, that problem and how they're structuring their business or positioning their business to address that particular, uh, that particular problem. Another big problem is access to market. Um, you also want to understand how, you know, they understand the logistics uh, complexities of providing access to farmers, right? Uh, both from the farm and to the market. Uh, which kind of market are they targeting? Are they targeting the export market? Are they targeting the local market? Uh, in the local market, are they working with, let's say, for example, hotels or Horeca? Are they working with vendors? Um, all these kinds of markets have different complexities and they have and present different opportunities uh, that for us would be interesting to understand, to be able to size to size the market and, and also um, sort of the competition as well. And we've seen very interesting opportunities, for instance, in the export market. Um, and, and, and in that particular uh, value chain, we, we, we typically ask ourselves, you know, uh, is this entrepreneur in the commodity space, uh, is he providing a, a particular product uh, that is unique, that he can be able to compete uh, with global players? Um, and you also want to understand some of these uh, complexities so that we can be able to size the opportunity yeah. and be able to see whether it's 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 um it's investable or not so in addition to what lloyd said i think that is also a critical part for us to to really understand especially when it comes to agriculture uh to understand the space in which a particular entrepreneur um wants to take advantage of no thanks peter and i really hope the businesses and smes that are online are really taking notes uh, so that, uh, you know, as you prepare yourself for an investor, uh, you know, you, you know what they're looking for. But let's flip it. Let's really flip it and see, and, and we talk to, to the businesses. And I would like to start with, you know, Femi. I mean, as a business, at what point uh, do you actually say, now I want to look for an investor? Because remember, when investors come in, they will probably, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, di disturb your current structure. 
So, uh, you know, if you could really talk to us a little bit, number one, at what point do you decide that it's important to look for an investor, whether it's debt or equity, but also what are some of the preparations? We know this is a long journey. So, uh, Femi, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Valentine. Um, so, I'm not so sure I can hear you, Femi. Um, I think maybe I'll answer the, the second one. Um, some of the preparations that I usually do uh, investment readiness. So, Femi, you, you, you may want to check you know, your, decent problem, your connection. Right, right, to that. Oh, yes. okay. We are getting you on and off. Do you mind actually just rechecking your connection? You know, you know, Femi, I'll come back to you. Let's move to, uh, to you know, Francis. Just recheck your connection because you're on and off. So Francis, uh, you know, same question. How do you prepare yourself for investors? At what point do you even make a decision that your business is ready to talk to investors? Francis. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, so for us, um, you know, being a CapEx heavy business, uh, we knew from the beginning that we didn't have the liquidity uh, that required to acquire some of these assets that we needed. Uh, so to give a bit of context, uh, so keep it cool is basically uh, cooling uh, as a service uh, uh, accelerator, uh, you know, and we provide this uh, solution to farmers all the way to the to the retail level. And um, so in our case, uh, it was it, it, it was uh, a question of uh, where do we start in terms of looking uh, for the investment, and yeah, it's you know. At, at that level, um, when you're starting and you just have the concept and it's capex heavy, uh, of course we didn't um, get uh, investors, but you know we try to look for other options. And um, in this uh, part of the world, uh, in Kenya, so we have these um, uh, circles. Uh, it was a very good platform for us to go and access um, the starting capital, uh, um, and so you know, and therefore we were able to get um, uh, the sort of traction. Uh, that is needed that then gives you a uh, sort of a profile that an investor will deem as you know con consider it or, or something that you can propose to an investor but before that of course it was quite difficult because you have to show um you know traction you have to show that of course that you know your your company is uh, the products that you're offering are quite uh, you know uh, there is willingness to buy from customers and all these kind of metrics that investors look at. Um, how do you become uh, investor ready? Um, it's an iteration. So uh, it's about, of course, uh, knowing your weak areas, first of all, your self-assessment. Uh, if you're coming from a strong technical background, um, of course, you might need someone to help you with the financial stuff or legal stuff and all, all that is, is required. And then you seek that help. Um, and this help, you can get it from individuals as consultants if you have enough money, or in some case, you can go through an accelerator. Uh, so we have different kind of uh, um, accelerators that are either full-time or part-time, or you, know, you can get this kind of support from different quarters. Um, and of course, that's the kind of support that uh, uh, the, the AgriDerum um, gave us in the beginning, uh, basically preparing um, uh, investment memo, uh, financial model, modeling, and all those kind of uh, things that you actually present to an investor. Uh, but I have to say, it's, uh, you know, it's not as easy as it sounds. It's something that, of course, you have uh, to have the, the grit and, and the passion for. Um, so, Francis, yeah. at, at, at that particular place, it would be nice to actually let the audience know, because I know you've received some investment. How many doors did you knock? How long did it take before you received your, <laughs> you know, after, yeah, not at the beginning, you know, when the business was already running, yeah. Yeah, so um, to be honest, uh, I think in 2020, we did over 300, uh, you know, handshakes with investors um, <laughs> and only 1% converted. So only yeah. three invested in us. So you can imagine uh, the odds of one in 99%. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it is a story that uh, 
is quite uh, uh, relatable with many African uh, founders, especially in agritech, because of course it cannot compete with other verticals like fintech, uh, which are growing uh, super quickly and attracting a lot of um, capital. Um, but nevertheless, you know, uh, we are here, and you know, I, I, I can see some of uh, agri entrepreneurs that I'm familiar with who have actually been in this journey together, struggling to fundraise, meeting in these kind of conferences, including uh, Food Locker, uh, Cinefa, and others. And so, it's it's a big challenge. Um, first of all, from the sector perspective, try to raise funds, and of course, uh, coming from the African uh, countries and and being an agri entrepreneur, it presents another. Uh, challenge. Um, and Francis, but nevertheless, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any view on between debt and equity? Uh, do you have any views on either of the two? Um, I think uh, it, it depends on what stage of 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 the of the you know of the of the of the of this growth you are as a startup. So mm -hmm. if you're early stage um, and you know you're just figuring out. Uh, the business model, whether it's applicable or not, um, it's easier to look for, uh, in our case, we looked for an accelerator that would, of course, share the risk with us. And you give them a bit of equity in the beginning, because then this be becomes a shared risk, a shared opportunity kind of uh, uh, setup. Uh, but if you prefer to go to debt and things don't work out, then it becomes much of a big risk. Um, and therefore, you know, it's not everyone that will get equity investment, but I will prioritize equity over debt at early stage uh, in that order because it creates different opportunities for you. And also the equity investor is likely to help you looking for other investors who will do the follow on um, investment. And before I go to, you know, Femi, you know, Francis, when you go for equity, did you have any fear around losing control? you know, the question of a big cake and a small cake and, you know, seeding part of your shareholding? Yes, uh, I think it's a genuine concern for most African uh, entrepreneurs. And, and, and this goes because sometimes uh, we sign things, uh, we, 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 we're not completely sure whether we understand the repercussions and there's always yeah. that fear, um, but always get uh, support uh, from other people and, and, you know, they help you read through the, the contract. Yeah. Um, and and uh, um, yeah, so it's a it's a genuine fear, it's a genuine concern because of course we have had situation where we have had hostile takeovers of of companies. Um, yeah. But again, it's better to be, uh, in my opinion, it's better to be um, part of a bigger thing and own something small uh, rather than to be yeah. to own something small and you know all of it. Okay. So. Perfect. Thank you, Francis. That, those are very, very good insights. And I do hope that uh, all the other businesses and SMEs that are online are, are picking those tidbits and ideas on how to move forward. Femi, let me check if your connection is better. So again, you know, quickly, how was your journey? The same questions I've asked, you know, Francis, uh, you know, low cause of control, equity debt, any view on those? Over to you, Femi. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I hope my sound is better now. Yeah, um, now I can hear you better. Awesome. So uh, basically, um, maybe I'll start from the top. Equity versus debt, I think it just really depends on what you're targeting for. Uh, so for example, from our perspective, we try to use debt for anything that has quicker returns. So if we're sure that we're going to be able to secure the, um, the cash flow requirements for repayment, uh, we would usually go for debt. And we're actually doing a lot of that now because the bulk of our uh, investments these days are more working capital finance. Um, for investments that are more long-term, so if it's, uh, for example, we want to do CapEx, and I think this is debatable, but we prefer in many cases to use equity for CapEx, uh, more because of the long-term uh, required. You're looking at a lot of capital early, and then you potentially can recoup that money over a longer period of time. Um, I think some people do it the other way around, but we prefer to do it this way, essentially because uh, in that way we can be a little bit more confident that whatever debt we are getting, we're putting in working capital, we're able to generate the cash flows. Um, also, uh, there is also, I mean, maybe referring to what Francis said regarding the stage of the business where you are at. So, I mean, for a business that is just starting that doesn't really have cash flows or doesn't really have a lot of profit or net income, 
um, or you know, you're probably not generating enough cash, you're, you're potentially going to want equity or grants because those allow you to then be able to create the foundation on which you can then build the business and then potentially bring on debt investors later. Um, how we did uh, historically, I think that, uh, for example, the CTA was very helpful and very instrumental to our success. Uh, and it was through the, um, the, the event that held in 2019, if I remember correctly, uh, in Ghana. And that was where we actually got that first uh, introduction to Agra, to AGRF, and then to the CTA, which is now uh, a part of another organization. Uh, the idea was um, we got all the support in terms of investment readiness, which was really very helpful. That introduced us to a lot of things on how do you set up your team, how do you structure, and you know there, there were some good facilitators also helped us with those. Um, but more importantly, the way we approach investment is first to do some research, to try to look for who are the right investors for the kind of uh, for the kind of profile that we are putting together in the market. So if, for example, uh, we're looking more at you know uh, investing in working capital. We're looking for people who want to invest in working capital. If we're looking more for software development or technology development, then we're looking for uh, people who want to put their money in those kind of things. So doing the preliminary research to find out whether there are even agreements between what we are looking for and the requirements on the investor side is like primary thing. And then you know there's the short listing, there's the whole outreach, which is you know whether it's cold calling or a soft introduction from somebody who already knows them and things like that, which are you know, pretty much the basics that go within the industry. Um, and then preparation of the documents, you know, showing traction, solve, making sure you're solving the right problem and being able to pitch that problem or pitch what your the solution you're offering to the right investor uh, are some of the things we have uh, done. Okay. So, um, and thanks for me. I mean, very good insight. So, I would like to run a quick question across the investors and their investees, because you have an investor on the one hand with preconditions, you have a business on the other hand that is looking for money, but there are intermediaries in between here who can support to prepare the businesses, services of which mo most investors are not willing to invest. So I just want to ask one minute each, Lloyd, these service providers who can help package businesses, what would you advise them to be doing? Thank you very much. The, uh, a lot of, um, uh, I think I see two sides of the, I, I may, I may, I'll talk about the two sides of the coin as far as, as financial advisors have been. And, and fortunately for me, I've worked as a financial advisor and, and I've been I'm in, also as a lender most of my life. I think the, it's, it's critical that the financial advisor understands the criteria, the lending criteria or investment criteria of the parties that he is taking his customers to, number one. Two, he must, there's a good point that uh, Francis mentioned here about what is your level of development? Where is your client? Now, if your client is at a certain phase of development, you would find that if he's say in agriculture production, concept that is not proven, he hasn't put it on his own equity, chances are that he may not be able to get a lot of uh, support because people want to see a concept that is proven. Now, unless that has been done, it becomes a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a problem. Um, and, 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 and hence, we, we, I recommend that the, 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 the financial advisor must drill deep into the business and, and, and then Second part, other than the phase itself, is to prepare this camp, the borrower. Yeah. Now, people come from different backgrounds. You could be a medical doctor, then therefore not interacted with lenders or interacted with investors. You need somebody to prepare you. Borrowing is an art. There is something about borrowing. For example, mm -hmm. when somebody is preparing you to be a borrower, it's a different conversation. When you borrow, and, and, and or what the borrower is the lender is expecting from you is not an excuse. They, they must prepare you for that. When the borrower says you go, the lender says you're going to submit management accounts, they must prepare you for that. There is nothing like I'm sorry, Friday I can't pay, I pay on Wednesday. No, no, no. It's a default. It, it's a different language. So yeah. the financial consultant must take a lot of time to prepare customer, 
to understand the culture and the implication mm -hmm. of the consequences of what they're getting into. And also mm -hmm. to make sure that the documentation being prepared is bankable. This is very, very great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Peter, one minute. What kind of, uh, uh, you, know, you, you know, preparation or work should be the service provider be investing in? I think one of the key things that uh, I see with financial advisors that uh, sometimes they miss a point on is, is they articulate a story that is sometimes different from the actual entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I would say is that the financial advisor should fully understand what the entrepreneur wants to articulate and not articulate what he thinks or she thinks can be able to sell. Because sometimes there's a mismatch in terms of what the financial advisor is articulating and what the entrepreneur really wants. And sometimes you get gaps in that particular kind of story. And if that is your first interaction, um, in, in certain instances, you, you find that you've missed an opportunity or an opportunity that was actually good. Um, uh, you end up not investing in it because um, the story uh, was not well articulated by the advisor, who's your first point of point. Okay. Francis, uh, I would like to shift the question. So the same question, where would you see governments or development uh, you know, partners investing in uh, in, the, in the case in which we need to prepare you as a business? Um, so allow me to talk from our perspective. Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, so uh, I think uh, it's been a challenge uh, in, in Africa for what you call the missing uh, middle. So there is that challenge of uh, there's those companies that slightly above the startup uh, and you know what you're calling the 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 middle level kind of of startups who um, really don't have that much traction and they they are of course have significant um, uh, sort of uh, is a significant kind of business and, and I think there is um, less funding in, in targeting this kind of companies. Um, uh, and so I think, uh, I don't know whether it's the government structure that are not um, uh, supporting this kind of uh, company. So for example, I think uh, I saw a survey the other day that only um, uh, startups are getting the lion's share of the, of, of, of the capital and large companies. So large companies are taking 50% and then the smaller comp the started starting companies are taking about 30%. And this cuts across banks, and also, you know, institutions and innovation funds, and therefore there is that, you know, missing middle um, gap, which is what um, companies like us are experiencing, and many other startups can be able uh, to relate with this kind of problem. So there is need uh, to be able to solve that because um, yes, it has been a, a, a challenge getting the startup fund, but it's actually a challenge getting the growth fund. Um, it, yeah, despite having now a proven concept, um, you, you end up being in a situation where, um, I don't know whether, what kind of support comes in to, uh, to these companies, obviously because uh, debt is not the best uh, solution in these in this kind of situations. And also uh, getting equity, uh, you have certain um, limitations because the, the, the prospective investor wants you to to be uh, generating uh, higher revenues than you are. And yeah. therefore, yeah, this is a kind of situation that most yeah. companies are finding themselves in. So it's no so longer- Our an service issue providers to should then be looking at that caliber of you know, business and seeing how they can you know, prepare. Exactly, exactly. And okay. you know, it's much easier to deal with this kind of businesses because they already understand what they're doing. They have their expertise. Yeah, yeah. And, but yeah, yeah, it's just a, okay. yeah. Okay. So for me, one minute. Where, where should governments and development you know, partners be putting their money? Uh, well, allow me to, to diverge a little bit from what the uh, majority of people have said. I think that one of the biggest problems is that there is a misalignment between the promises that the investors give their LPs uh, versus what the market actually needs. So, and this is what I mean. Um, the market, for example, needs um, capital that comes in at probably 12%, 15% interest rate to the final uh, user. Uh, but an, an investor has gone to raise money uh, that requires 10x of that capital. Now, there's already a misalignment because regardless of what the startup tries to do, 
the problem is that the investment thesis of the investor cannot actually meet the needs of the market. Uh, I think the, the consultation should be both ways. So there is a consultation uh, that should happen with startups, which I think the majority of people have discussed on the panel. Uh, but I think there should be also that feedback consultation to the investors to say, this is really what's happening in this market. And we have to actually seek for capital that can actually solve the problems of this market. Otherwise, we're going to keep coming back to the same problem. Uh, there will be a mismatch. And, uh, you know, the, the startups essentially would not be able to access that capital. Uh, that, that's really what some of the things we have said. Okay. So thanks. I would like to now have a quick look at some of the questions that have been raised by, uh, you know, uh, by our delegates this afternoon. And I think this is a question we can take to the, either to Lloyd or to Bita. How do I come up with a compelling business model for investors? Between the two of you who would like to pick that question. Um, Lloyd, I see you online, yes. <laughs> I think I always, I always believe, I always ask people the question, if yeah. we were to reverse raw, would yeah. you invest money in that business proposal you are holding? Can you, can you risk your own cash? Yeah. Okay. That, that, that is one of the easiest way, first of all, I would say to test. However, to summarize, I think viability is number one. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the investors, what you want to see is uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a viable uh, uh, a proposal that encompasses uh, the requirements, especially the key investment guidelines. My advice is get a, if you're not in a good position, identify a good financial advisor, don't be yeah. stingy, pay for it. Uh, okay. You pay for what you get. I think if you get a good advisor, that will be helpful to help you. That understands the requirements of the lender. Okay, thanks so much. Bita, let me give you a different you know, question. What percentage is good to offer an equity investor? Well, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Uh, uh, and, and it has many starters, but what I would say is that um, as little as possible, especially mm -hmm. when the company is very young. And the reason I say that is because um, for a company that will require to raise additional funding subsequently, uh, you want an, in, an, an, an entrepreneur that is motivated. Um, and so you want the entrepreneur to stay in the business for a long time and to be motivated. So. If, he, if the entrepreneur is going to have a small stake um, in the later rounds or early enough, I mean, if you're doing the second round and the entrepreneur already has a very small stake in the business um, and you in the initial stages invested um, because you believed in the entrepreneur, uh, then your investment thesis is, is, is not going to hold water um, because it's going to be demotivated and it's not going to actually uh, actualize the returns that you had initially thought you would. Um, but also that comes with a catch, a catch in the sense that in order to give an investor a small stake early on, it means that uh, you really need to understand the point in which you're raising funding, uh, that the funding that you're raising must actually go into, uh, your, it should be well thought out, it should go into the uh, development of the business, you should have some sort of traction that is substantial enough uh, that a small stake would make sense uh, okay. to an investor so it's a very it's a very tight spot um okay. for both the investor and the so both either to Lo to lloyd and and Bita, um in in many cases you are investing in a business is there an opportunity where you in, you can invest in a business that is trying to acquire another business yes yeah that's uh that's very possible uh as long as it makes business sense yeah it's allowed and it uh but however, I must emphasize in development finance, generally yeah. business acquisition or refinancing are deemed to be outside policy. Uh, the, the market is not very broad, it's limited. Yeah, but it is doable. We are financed uh, acquisition uh, as a, a APC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Bita, any addition before we move to the next session? Yeah, I, I think I agree with, with, with Lloyd. We, we can okay. finance acquisitions of businesses. Um, yeah. but of course, it's dependent on a case-by-case on case basis in our case. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, I really want to thank you, Lloyd, Bita, Femi, and Francis. And, you know, the people who are online, if you have any specific questions you'd like to uh, ask them, you know, specifically, please also 
you can reach them you know, directly either through chat or through the Q&A. And I really, really want to thank you for making time and for really sharing honestly, uh, you know, the investment journey, you know, both from an investor's perspective, but also from a business perspective. So I'd like to uh, move over to um, cross boundary. I uh, hope Cynthia is online. Oh, yeah. And for our Kenya Rwanda delegates, uh, we were slightly off, but I th I'm, I'm told we are back. So apologies uh, if you missed that interpretation, a bit of technical hitches, but now we are back. Um, so I think it's Benjamin from the cross boundary side. Is it Cynthia or you know Benjamin? Let me see. Um, Cynthia from Cross Boundary. Ah, good. Lovely, Cynthia. So, Cynthia, you have a few minutes just to walk us through, uh, you know, what are some of the preparations that, uh, you know, businesses, both investors and investees, need to undertake as they prepare uh, to match each other. Over to you, Cynthia. Okay. Thanks so much, Valentine. I'm going to um, share my screen. Sorry. And Cynthia, if you can take, you know, just 10 minutes so that also if, if people have some questions, they could do that. Yeah, I would really appreciate it. Okay. Okay, got it. Thanks so much. My name is Cynthia. Um, I'm, I work for Cross Boundary and we have been implementing the matchmaking component of the agribusiness deal room for about three years now, working very closely with Agra to um, unlock or use capital to, to stimulate growth in, in agri agriculture. So our role in the agribusiness deal room essentially is to enable different stakeholders in the ecosystem to be to meet and to have conversations that could be able to propel towards um, financial clues. And so what happens in the deal room essentially is that we look for opportunities and we look for capital um, capital providers who are interested in these opportunities and we bring this together and hope that um, the discussions would progress towards financial tools and we would be able to grow or support different SMEs in agriculture to grow their businesses. My apologies, Cynthia. So for, for delegates, please, if you have any specific questions that Cynthia is you know, presenting, please also share them in the Q&A. We will try and uh, ensure that she answers them. Please carry on, Cynthia, my apologies. Okay, thanks. So essentially to participate um, as an SME that wants to participate in the agribusiness deal room, the first thing that they need to do is ensure that they have gone through the qualification criteria that we've put together and ensure that they um, properly fit the selection criteria before they proceed to, to apply. So the gist of it is that the business needs to be um, an, in agriculture and has a strong linkage to um, smallholder farmers and has operations in the African continent or intends to expand into Africa within the next six to 12 months and has a clear business model that where um, the, the concept has been proven in their post revenue and are actually looking to, to raise fund, funding. So the process on the deal room is quite straightforward. Once we have um, outlined the selection criteria, Typically, the team will then move on to conduct outreach to different SMEs in the region, and we invite them to apply. So you would receive um, an email from an Agra partner or from Agra itself inviting you to apply for the Agri Business Deal Room. Um, and you, typically, you will attach the proof a profiling template. Or another way to go about it is to go to, to visit the AGRF website, and there you also find instructions on how to apply as well as the different profiling templates that we use. So once SMEs have completed this profiling templates, they then submit them to um, the deal room at agra.org email address. And the team is able to access all of the different profiles through this address. And then we proceed to review the submitted profiles. And typically we'll, prior we'll do it on a first come first serve basis and prioritize um, templates that are fully completed. So every time we do the outreach, we always encourage SMEs to make sure that they have fully completed the profiles. And then if there's any, um, any, any feedback or any action items that we still require from the SMEs, we'll typically reach out to them and ask them to supplement the profiles um, before then 
creating an account for them on the agribusiness children platform where they then can be able to interact with the different stakeholders throughout so typically the the process from outlining the selection criteria to the outreach occurs between mid august but these timelines may vary and we then re our review of the profiles and subsequent matching of the different SMEs with stakeholders uh, we carry out across the year. And here, what we do is that we try to equip the SMEs with as many resources as we can to enable them to utilize or to get maximum utilization from the field platform. So we'll typically hold webinars uh, on certain topics that SMEs or investors will have raised, just trying to uh, upskill these SMEs in this sector for learning, section, learning sessions and how to use a platform, um, provide a resource bank with different materials that uh, SMEs can leverage, just to ensure that the experience on their on the platform has been maximized. And then the last component of the um, process is where then we share out SME profiles with different investors. And then if an investor shows interest in an SME, we, continue, we proceed to uh, connect the two so that they, they can begin the conversations. So we either do that matchmaking directly where we match the SME to the investor, or they can also um, link with investors on the platform itself. So this is an example of what the profiling template that we use for SMEs looks like. It has three key sections. The company overview, which gives basically a brief of what the company is about. So it, it contains a brief description of the company, the market, the problem that they're trying to solve for uh, the value chain and, and countries that they're focused on, and a brief or yeah, a brief summary of their financial performance over the past two years. We also have a finance, financing and expansion overview section, which is intended to communicate to investors the financing needs of the company. So it will have details on, on things such as um, how much the company is raising, what kinds of instruments it's raising, the split between those different kinds of in instruments, if any, the use of funds of these documents, if they've had any, if the SME has had any experience raising capital before, amongst other things. We also have a governance and metrics section that kind of just paints a picture of the governance style of the management team of the SME. So all of these are intended to be able to give a brief but very detailed overview of the company to the investor so that it gives a good indicate, so that they're able to make a good judgment on whether or not they would be interested in the opportunity. The process for investors is pretty similar to that for SMEs. So we'll, we typically will start off by mobilizing investors to participate in the deal room. So similar to SMEs, we'll, we'll reach out to our network of investors and invite them to participate in the active business deal room. And as we do so, we'll share um, a profiling template that has been curated for investors and we'll work very closely with them to ensure that they are able to fully populate these profiles. Um, and then once they, they've done so, similar to SMEs, we'll upload this to the deal room, to the agribusiness deal room platform. Um, and then where they can now start to engage with SMEs. So they can either do that directly or through us. Um, and so similar to how we share SME profiles with investors, we also, we also share um, investor profiles with SMEs. And typically, once an investor shows interest in a certain company, then we'll introduce the investor to the SME and facilitate the initiation of those discussions. And then we'll keep um, checking in with both parties to see how those conversations are progressing and to address any bottlenecks in the process or to just see what's, to, to understand what's going well or what's not working so well. And so as we share, this is, this is a sample of the profiling templates that we use for capital providers. And it has all of the relevant information that an SME would need to identify whether or not the investor is a good fit for their fundraising needs. And so typically, as we share the profile, the completed uh, investor profiles with capital seekers, 
we will encourage them to thoroughly go through, through it and make and only reach out to those investors that they feel best suit their fundraising needs. Um, and so some of the things that we cover in this template include the capital providers investment chair, uh, their sector value chain focus, the target, target ticket size, fundraising instruments, investment horizon amongst other things. So this again is meant to give the enterprise a good picture of what the capital provider provides and be able to assess its own needs and see if they're a good fit. And then we'll encourage the enterprises to then use the deal room platform to reach out to the capital providers. So we've, again, we've done this for the past couple of years and we've had good feedback and we've seen good results from um, the diff from our matchmaking efforts and we hope that the deal room, the, the agribusiness deal room can continue to be a platform that catalyzes growth in agribusiness through unlocking capital. Thanks. Are you done? Sorry. Yes, yes that's all for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Let me see if there are any questions uh, in the Q and A box. Uh, so, so Cynthia, there, uh, there is a question. So, if someone submitted last year, should they submit again? So, yes, because sometimes the needs of the company will have changed from year to year. And also for this year's profile or this year's profiling template as opposed to capturing data on 29, 29, 20, 20 and 2021, we'll need data on 2021. Sorry, as opposed to capturing financial performance for 2019 and 2020, we'll require financial performance for 2020, 2021. So typically there's usually very minimal updates, but um, sometimes there are some updates that we'll need to capture. So it's good for the company to resubmit their profile. And it should be easy if they've done it before as well. Okay. Another question, you know, Cynthia, is there a specific criteria that qualifies an SME for the agribusiness deal room? Yes. Um, and I'll just maybe let me just reshare that the screen with uh, the investment criteria. So um, most so the criteria is based on primarily the sector that the company is in. So it needs to be an agribusiness that has a clear link to smallholder farmers. And it could be any kind of agribusiness. It could be cold chain, it could be um, processing, it could be primary ag agriculture, it could be active, but just an, a link to agriculture and a clear link to smallholder farmers. And then the company also needs to have operations on the African continent already, or to be planning to expand into the region within the next six to 12 months. So we're looking for African agribusinesses. And then the business also needs to be post revenue or have shown um, a proof of concept with a product already in the market. Um, and this business must also have like a clear business model and must be looking to raise capital. So those are the key criteria, but there's also other sub criteria like huge development, environmental impact, smallholder impact amongst others, but the key three that we look out for are the sector country and stage of business. Okay. Thanks, Cynthia. There's another question. Uh, so one of our delegates had two-year financial. So the main question is, does it only mean that we work with SMEs that are two years old and beyond? Um, no, so if you if you if they only have one year financial information, they can just include that, and then that, and that should be fine. So if they only have financial information for one year, they could only they could include the financial information for the year that they they do have. Okay, another question. Um, there's a delegate from Cameroon. Is asking, can he, or I think it's a son, I'm not sure if it's a he or a she, can they be able to submit to the deal room 
if they are coming from Cameroon. So maybe I know since you could keep our African footprint. But any any company in Af in any African country is eligible, including Cameroon. Let me see if I missed any other question. I think that's it. Okay. So um, I think the, the 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 other question is if we're going to share this presentation. Since if, if if I'm not wrong, all this information is available on our website. So if you could share the link to the yeah. Agri Business Deal Room um, microsite, it would really help the delegates to go through it and get all this information. Let me let me share the the link to the website where you can find um, details on how to go about applying as well as where you can download uh, the different profile interface. Okay. And then I think just a final one, uh, and maybe you could just give a quick highlight. What do investors focus on during due diligence? I think that would be a nice one. I know both Lloyd and Peter did mention it, but just a, a few quick highlights on what are some of those key things they look for when they're doing due diligence. Um, so the investors will look at a number of different things. So in a number of different buckets, operational wise, they'll want to see that, you know, what you've said the business does, it actually does. So they'll want to see how the entire, um, the entire process that the product or business goes through from how the product or service is produced or developed all the way to how it reaches the final consumer and if that makes sense and if there's any bottlenecks within or risks within that process or that procedure. They'll also need to look at the financials of the company to ensure that it's a viable investment or it fits their criteria appropriately. So typically for that, they'll ask for things like a business model where they'll want to see, you know, what was your past performance like and what are you projecting and do your projections make sense. Um, and that's where they also kind of go through things like checking whether the returns from that investment makes sense for them based on these projections. They'll also take a review of the management team because they're the ones leading the business and essentially the a business is how it's managed or it, it, it is its people. So they also want to ensure that the management team has the proper expertise as well as the relevant experience to properly drive that business towards what the growth projections are. So they need to have faith in, in the management team as well. So those are kind of some things that investors will look for in due diligence. Okay. And Cynthia, could you share some of the timelines for the 2022 you know, preparation for the agribusiness deal room? Um, yeah, but I, I think Mumbi would be better pleased to answer that, but um, okay. the call for submission is out already, so businesses can, can start um, submitting, but Mumbi, I think, has better visibility. Okay. Good. So I don't see any other questions. So, for example, there's someone who's asking where the Agra offices are in Nigeria. They are in Abuja. I, I really don't know the specific, you know, student address, but they are, our Agra offices are in Abuja. And I think we've covered all the questions that have been asked. So thank you so much, Cynthia, for very elaborate you know, presentation on the support that we do provide businesses and investors as they prepare for the agribusiness deal room. And with that, I would like to shift over the meeting to Mumbi, who will give us some closing remarks, but also some of the next steps, and also share with us you know, some of the engagement we will be having, even as we prepare for our September summit. Over to you, Mumbi. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, Valentine. And uh, this has been an amazing end to the day for us here in uh, East Africa. I know it's mid um, afternoon for our colleagues in West Africa and Maybe for those joining us from outside Africa, it's early in the morning. Um, but for us, it's been an amazing end to the day, uh, just seeing all the different entrepreneurs that have joined us for this session. Um, and I really hope, it's my sincere hope that it has been valuable 
to all our stakeholders and um, has provided additional insight and guidance uh, to give you confidence in your fundraising journey. And one of the things I think Francis is the one who's, who, who, who answered the question on how many doors he knocked and he said 300 with a 1% conversion rate. Um, and, and that may sound discouraging, but I think for us as entrepreneurs, what we, what we need to take away is, is that, that we need that resilience. We need that um, determination on this journey is what I'd like to encourage you that um, you'll join the deal room this year and um, maybe speak to two investors, but keep having that engagement, keep submitting um, the information even as your company is growing. Um, keep talking to different stakeholders that want to talk to you. Um, at the end of the day, you convert one and you convert one and you begin to convert others. Um, now, uh, uh, I, I want to mention a few important things. Um, one is that the link to our deal room website has been shared multiple times in the chat box. Um, I will also share it again just now um, for you to go to where you find the form that Cynthia has taken you through. This form allows us to know what your needs are, what your fundraising needs are. Um, and then allows us to match you to um, the appropriate investor. One of our um, principles at the deal room is that we want to ensure that it's the right match. Um, it's the right investor to the right SME. The due diligence we do is of both the investor and, and, the, and the SME, um, just so that that journey is, is fruitful um, uh, and yields a converted deal. So please go in there, look at the form. Um, if you have any questions, um, send them to dealroom at agra.org and we'll be able to address and support you in completing that form. The second thing um, that I would like to mention, or maybe before I go to the second thing, I can answer the question on the deadline for submissions. Um, this year, our deadline uh, for submissions will be, the first deadline will be in July. What we've been doing is we've been running it in um, batches. So the first deadline will be end of July. We would like to have all your forms in. Um, and then the next cohort will be after September. So um, when you're ready, if you're ready by uh, end of July, please complete and submit your form to dealroom at agra.org. The link has been shared uh, uh, in the chat box. The second thing I want to mention is that this year we've been running webinars uh, to support SMEs understand how to prepare their financial modeling. We've had another webinar on what documents do you need to prepare before you meet investors. Um, we've had another webinar on record keeping. So we've run a series of knowledge sessions for SMEs and these are available also on our website that you can access in the event that you, you, you were not able to attend those sessions. So please make use of these resources. Um, they're available to you uh, even ahead of, of, of submitting your form and just to better understand how to pitch your business. Uh, I think uh, uh, what then I would add here is Vanessa introduced the deal room and the pillars that um, the, the, the four different pillars that we have at the deal room. And this webinar has focused largely on the investor matchmaking, SMEs to investors, um, which, which, which is a huge component of the work that we do. But I want, us, I want to remind us because I've seen questions coming in asking, what if we are a social enterprise or um, what if we're just starting out or just different questions that are uh, where entrepreneurs are um, questioning their fit uh, based on the criteria that we've set out. Now, the deal room does not only offer investor matchmaking. We also support in um, uh, several things. One is knowledge sharing. When there are opportunities for technical assistance by incubator programs, accelerator programs, by development partners, we share them on the platform. So, you know, don't shy away from coming into the deal room, even if you're not ready to fundraise. We share a lot of other opportunities that are happening um, so that you can access. Uh, the second thing is we also facilitate linkages across the supply chain. 
So SME to SME linkages, uh, we found SMEs that want maybe to enter a new market in a, in a different country and are looking for a similar partner in that country. Um, and through the deal room, they make that connection and they're able to expand their market. Or an SME that's looking to work with a bigger player um, in, in, in the, on the continent. So uh, I think if, you, if you're not at the place where you're fundraising, the deal room is still a place that um, can provide services for you and you're welcome. You're welcome there. So at this juncture, I think um, I'd like to just maybe thank my able panelists for accepting to be um, to, to, to share with us their experiences um, as honestly as they have um, and to making the time to speak with us and also just to thank uh, all 300 of you that have been on this, this webinar. I think uh, we are uh, expecting to see all of you at the AGRF this year that will be happening September 5th to 9th in Kigali, Rwanda. We welcome you there and we'll be sharing with you um, um, the links to just register also for the AGRF um, after the webinar. So I'll hand this over back to Valentine to um, just close and Asante. Thank you so much, Mumbi, and uh, you know, thank you for those wonderful remarks. Uh, very key issues that she has raised there that I do hope both investors and businesses will take note because as we said earlier, um, when we started this meeting today, is that the opportunity to increase investment on the continent is quite huge. There's, there's lots and lots of money that is actually needed to bring about the food systems you know, transformation and investors online are looking for investees and investees are looking for investors. So let's keep working together. The other thing I just want to re-emphasize that the AGRF this year will be in person hosted by the government of Rwanda and AGRF. So we are really looking forward, uh, even as we uh, go over the, you know, the COVID issues, to have a face-to-face -face and in-person AGRF in Kigali on the dates on the 5th to 9th of September. Uh, finally, uh, I think it is important to re-emphasize that uh, you know, in between, uh, keep looking at our microsite. There's lots of information that is shared there. Let's keep engaging and our able teams uh, will be available to respond to. So thank you so much for those that is early morning, especially uh, in the Americas, have a good morning. For those in Africa, Europe and in Asia, have a lovely afternoon and a good evening. Thank you so much and bye-bye.